Many thanks for the kind invitation. It's a great honor for me to speak at the Chinese Lexical Semantics Workshop 2020. And I would love to be with you at the City University of Hong Kong today, but that will have to wait for another time. Now, luckily, ideas and insights can still move freely between us, and I look forward to seeing you in person sometime very soon. In my talk today, I want to discuss constructions and their collocates, with a special focus on the issue of what lexical semantics can teach us about the meaning of grammar. My work is situated in the field of construction grammar, and one of the central tenets of that framework is that knowledge of language can be exhaustively described in terms of form-meaning pairings. In other words, not only lexical elements have meaning, but grammatical constructions, syntactic and morphological patterns, they have meanings too. Now, how can we capture and describe the meaning of these grammatical constructions? Grammatical meanings, they tend to be abstract, schematic, fuzzy, and many grammatical forms are heavily polysemous. So all of this makes describing grammatical meanings difficult. Studying the meanings of grammar is a challenge that I've been really fascinated by. And as you can see from the subtitle of my talk, I think that lexical semantics holds very important cues to the analysis of what grammatical constructions mean. Now, I take a view of language that is shared by more and more researchers and construction grammar in which linguistic knowledge is modeled as a network and constructions are seen as nodes within that network. To take a concrete example that you see on the slide here, um, in this view, constructions such as the English auxiliary verb will form an associative network with other linguistic units in particular with the lexical verbs that they take as infinitive complements. So an assumption that I'm making is that when a speaker knows that auxiliary, they not only know its general morphosyntactic behavior, so that it takes an infinitive, that it inverts with the subject in questions, or that it takes negative contractions. Um, in addition, speakers know that will tends to co-occur with some lexical verbs more frequently than with others. So some of the associative links that you see here, they are stronger than others. And this, I think, is part and parcel of linguistic knowledge. So this, if you like, is my starting point, my basic assumption, which leads me into three claims that I'd like to defend in this talk. So the first of these three claims is that the meaning of grammatical constructions is reflected in the lexical elements that typically occur within these constructions. If we borrow from John Rupert Firth, we can say that we shall know the meaning of a construction by the company it keeps. Grammar, of course, is an ever-changing dynamic system. And so my second claim is that semantic change of grammatical constructions can be seen in collocational shifts that these constructions undergo. As constructions change in meaning, they part company with some lexical elements and they start to co-occur with others. I hope to illustrate these ideas with corpus-based research that I've been doing. And this leads me to my third claim in which I argue that corpus-based distributional methods can help to uncover the mutual associations between constructions and their lexical collocates. The evidence that I'd like to present for these claims comes from work of mine that I've been doing over the past 15 years. And I apologize for the fact that all my examples in this talk will be from English and actually just from a single grammatical domain, namely the one of modality. I will start with work that analyzes the collocational preferences of the English future marker will and how they have changed over time. And after that, I'll try to convince you that the approach of studying grammatical constructions via their lexical collocates can also work for an entire grammatical paradigm. And this I'll illustrate with a study on reorganization in the English modal system. In the third part, I will discuss how the lexical collocate of English may can be modeled as a semantic space and how we can detect changes in that semantic space. Part four uh, discusses recent work that I've been doing together with Susanne Flach. Together, we've been working on a method that uses second-order collocates uh, 
uh, for the purpose of contrasting near synonymous grammatical elements such as may and might and must and have to. All right, so let's go. My interest in construction-specific collocations was sparked by two mentors of mine, namely Anatol Stefanovic and Stefan Gris, who are the developers of what is called colostructional analysis. They argue explicitly that constructional meaning is reflected in associations between syntactic patterns and lexical elements. So a sentence such as John gave Mary the book instantiates the ditransitive construction, which has as its basic meaning the idea of a transfer, and which commonly enough occurs with the verb give. The sentence, uh, he elbowed his way through the crowd, instantiates the way construction, which conveys the idea of a laborious movement along a path. And here we tend to find verbs like the denominal verb elbow, conveying exactly the kind of difficult movement that the construction commonly expresses. So patterns like these suggest that syntax is in fact meaningful, and in the quote that you see here, Gris and Stefanovic argue just that. If syntactic structures served as meaningless templates waiting for the insertion of lexical material, no significant associations between these templates and specific verbs would be expected. Okay, so colostructional analysis allows us to figure out the meaning of constructions. But how exactly does that work? <clears throat> Basically, what we need are co-occurrence frequencies between words and constructions. So we take a corpus, visualized here as a collection of words, and from this collection of words, we retrieve all elements of a construction and determine the frequencies of the lexical elements that occur within the construction. So in this toy example here, we have a small set of uh, lexical collocates, namely three times uh, the collocate X, tw uh, three times Y, and just one Z. <clears throat> and colostructional analysis is essentially a comparison of observed and expected frequencies. We check whether the lexical elements that we find in the construction are overrepresented or underrepresented given their overall frequency in the corpus. So in this case, X and Y are equal in terms of how often they occur in the construction, but their expected frequencies differ. X is about as frequent as we would expect because it really occurs all over the corpus. Um, but Y is really much more frequent in the construction than expected. So it is surprisingly overrepresented in the construction. Right, so this kind of logic I applied to English will in the British National Corpus. And on this slide, you see the verbs that are most strongly overrepresented with will. We don't have to look at them in detail here, but essentially the table shows two things. First of all, English will forms an associative network in which some links to lexical verbs are much stronger than others. And second, if we look at the strongest links, we can actually figure out that will has a relative preference for verbs that have a certain meaning, specifically meanings that are non-agentive and atelic. So verbs like need or continue or depend, and there are others in the table that we could point to. Now, these preferences can be usefully contrasted with the collocates of near synonymous constructions such as shall or be going to, but even more interestingly, they can form the basis for a diachronic analysis in which a network from one historical period can be compared to another period. So let's take the results from the BNC that indicate that during the 1990s, verbs such as come, depend, and continue were actually very strongly associated with will. So in speakers' minds, the associations between will and these verbs were stronger than associations with other verbs. Now, let's suppose that we have data from earlier centuries. So here it could turn out that for certain verbs, the associations were weaker, whereas for others, the associations were actually stronger. So even though the grammatical construction with will has remained structurally the same, yeah, morphosyntactically, nothing has changed, but something in speakers' knowledge of language has changed nonetheless, 
namely the collocational preferences of will. The overall logic of colostructional analysis can be exploited for this purpose. So instead of a design that compares observed and expected frequencies across a construction and a corpus, we can use a diachronic corpus that holds data from different historical periods, and we can retrieve examples of the same construction from different periods of time. So we can now apply the very same idea and investigate whether some elements are overrepresented in one period and underrepresented in another. And tracking these changes allows us to say something about semantic change and even grammaticalization in that construction. I did this for English will on the basis of early and late modern English data, and the analysis gave me the most distinctive elements for each of the periods under investigation. So in earlier periods, we find verbs that encode representative and commissive speech acts, such as declare or deny or assure. Um, we also find verbs that encode volitional actions, such as destroy or send. And then in later periods, uh, for example, these speech act verbs are conspicuously absent. Yeah? Um, instead, we find the emergence of verbs that encode involuntary actions, such as cry or smile. Uh, we find actions that um, inanimate entities are capable of, so verbs like flow, for example. And uh, as we move on to the very last periods, we see that highly general verbs such as come, get, have, and go become more and more overrepresented in these periods. So this reflects the semantic generalization of the construction, the endpoint of grammaticalization, if you will. So colostructional analysis necessarily focuses on the most strongly attracted elements. You can also apply it to the least strongly attracted elements, the repelled elements, but this is not something I want to focus on here. So, in a sense, what a colostructional analysis can show you is the tip of the semantic iceberg. Naturally, there's much more going on, and we would like to understand how the entire semantic spectrum of a construction changes over time. This can actually be done but it requires a different approach, namely one that takes an entire paradigm of constructions into view. And that's what we're going to do now. So in this study, I'll be looking at associations between constructions and their collocates on a more systemic level. For the analysis, I've used the corpus of historical American English, which is a corpus of different written genres spanning some 200 years, which are divided into decades. And I retrieved data for the nine core English modals, followed by a verb in the infinitive. In order to maintain the best possible balance of text types in the corpus, I restricted the study to 15 decades of the COA, starting with the 1860s and ending with the 2000s. <clears throat> I organized that data in tabular format, so here we have a slice of data from the 1860s, and in the columns you see the nine modals, can, could, may, might, must, shall, should, will, and would, and in the lines are the frequencies of the lexical verbs that collocate with them. And you see that highly frequent verbs such as be, do, see, and have, they are frequent with all of the modals, but there are already some interesting asymmetries that are apparent in the raw frequencies. For example, can and could show similar frequencies for be, do, see, and make, if you compare them, but then can have is a lot less frequent than could have. In my analysis of will, I was interested in analyzing its most typical lexical collocates in order to figure out its grammatical meaning. In this study, I'm not looking at the lexical collocates themselves, but rather I'm looking at quantitative differences between the nine modals. And the reasoning would be that if two modals occur with similar sets of collocates at similar frequencies, then we can assume that they stand in a very close semantic relation. 
For instance, we can look at could and may and contrast the frequencies of their lexical collocates, and we can then compare that against the differences between, for example, should and must. So which pair of the two is semantically more closely associated? Comparisons of this kind reveal that, for example, could and may have collocational profiles that are actually quite divergent. So this graph shows that many frequent collocates of could are actually infrequent with may and vice versa. Other pairs of modals correlate more tightly, for instance, should and must. So if we come up with pairwise comparisons for all nine modals, we can quantitatively assess all mutual similarities and use a dimension-reducing method to represent those differences in a graph such as the one that you see here. So this graph shows the nine modals arranged on a two-dimensional map that reflects collocational behavior. Uh, this is based on data from the 1860s. Each modal construction is a bubble, and bubbles that are close to one another occur with similar sets of lexical verbs at similar frequencies. Bubble size in this graph represents text frequency, so would is the most frequent modal, shall is the least frequent one. Okay, so how should we interpret this graph? There are several things that we can see here. First, we see that must, should, and shall uh, pattern closely together. So these are modals that encode obligations, things that you have to do. Uh, we see might and could together. So these are modals that encode possibilities, epistemic meanings, if you like. And we see that would has uh, very much a profile of its own. Yeah? I would now like to show you how these modals developed over the past 150 years. Specifically, I would like you to focus on the modal may down here. And um, in the overall development that takes place, it is clear that the modals are on the move, which is an established finding in the literature. And what happens with may is that it joins the ranks of should, must, and might, which cluster in this area of the graph up here. So in our time, this is where they are. Uh, so they are definitely more similar in terms of their collocates today than they used to be 150 years ago. So what happened to May has elsewhere been described as a development towards more and more epistemic meaning. And looking at this graph, I was wondering whether this was actually what was going on. So I decided to look a little more closely. Turning once more to the diachronic application of collastructional analysis, I contrasted the verbs that occur with may in the 1860s against the verbs that occur with it in the 2000s, checking for asymmetries in the distribution. So the verbs that you see in this table are the verbs whose distribution is maximally uneven across the two decades. For instance, uh, the verb say is overrepresented in early data. May say occurs 277 times in the 1860s, which is a lot more than we would expect by chance. Conversely, uh, the verb help is overrepresented in later data, so may help occurs more often than expected in the 2000s. Of course, in order to be able to say something meaningful about these contrasts, we have to look at actual examples with these verbs. If we turn to the underlying corpus data and if we look at examples with the verbs that are associated with the respective periods, then it turns out that examples with say, do, add, and judge, which are characteristic of the 1860s, indeed predominantly encode permissive meanings. So we find expressions like if I may say so, or you may do that if you like, or if I may add something, or if I may judge. Okay, Permissive meanings with verbs that are typical of earlier data. Now, on the other hand, verbs like have or help or want or need they tend to occur in examples that encode epistemic meanings. So uh, for the 2000s, we have examples like I may have told you, or antihistamines may help, or the police may want to speak with you. And all of these encode possibilities uh, 
rather than permission. Okay, so in the light of this additional evidence, I actually feel comfortable interpreting the move of May that we've seen a minute ago as a move into epistemic territory. And this kind of insight is really just possible if an entire paradigm of constructions is taken into view at the same time. Right. In the third part of this talk, I would like to elaborate a bit on the shifting preferences of May. So how has this associative network of May shifted over the past 200 years? The colostructional analyses that you've seen, they give us the peak of the iceberg. They show us the elements that are most strongly attracted to May at any given time. But of course, there's much more going on than that. And in order to see the part of the iceberg that is below the waterline, I turn to distributional semantics and to an analysis of the 250 most frequent verbal collocates of May. So for all of these verbs, I built context vectors on the basis of their collocates to the left and right. I compared these context vectors to each other, which allowed me to construct a semantic vector space of the verbs that co-occur with may. Now, just very quickly to illustrate this approach, um, let's take the verb cry as an example. So here you see a small sample concordance of the verb cry. And from that concordance, I eliminated all stop words, that is, grammatical items such as pronouns and articles. And once the stop words were removed, I uh, put all the remaining context elements into a bag of words that represents the context of the verb cry. So this can be turned into a frequency word list that represents the context vector and in fact the meaning of the verb cry. I build context vectors of this kind not only for cry but for all other verbs that occur with may including laugh, smile and well 247 others that went into this analysis. <clears throat> right. Um, again, using methods of dimension reduction, all of this information can be condensed into a two-dimensional representation like the one that you see here. So since this will be very hard to read for you on your screens, let me just explain what we see in this graph. So on this graph, all 250 lexical verbs that occur with may are arranged according to their collocational behavior. So this is not at all unlike what you've seen earlier with the paradigm of the English models, except now we have more elements and the elements are lexical. So verbs with similar collocational profiles are close to each other and similar collocates often mean similar meanings. So this means that we can read the graph as a semantic landscape with different semantic areas. For example, in the lower right of the graph, we find verbs of physical action, such as run, open, pick, walk, sit, and go, things that you do with your body. Um, in the upper left of the graph, we find a very different set of verbs, namely verbs that denote abstract processes, including influence, differ, derive, and concern. <clears throat> Uh, in the upper right, we find a cluster of speech act verbs uh, that include verbs such as say, guess, ask, wonder, and speak. And of course, I'm simplifying here, um, perhaps more than I should. But I would argue that a good way to read this graph heuristically, yeah, if you want to find your way around the semantic landscape, would be to understand it as a continuum from abstract to concrete on the x-axis and as a continuum from volitional to involuntary on the y-axis. So at the bottom of the graph we have create and allow on the left and put and go on the right. Create and allow relatively abstract, put and go relatively concrete. Now, at the top, we have uh, involuntary actions, so desire on the left and smile and laugh on the right. Desire, a bit more abstract, a bit more hard to describe, smile and laugh, physical bodily actions. 
Okay, so this just as a broad orientation in the semantic space, but how do we get back to May and its semantic development? What you can do with this graph is to overlay the semantic space with the usage frequencies of May and its verbal collocates across different historical periods. Put simply, we can ask where in the semantic space are verbs um, that show a particularly strong association with May at any given time. Is there a pattern? And if so, how does that pattern change over time? <clears throat> On this slide, you see the graph overlaid with token frequencies of May with the respective verbs during the first half of the 19th century. The peaks and valleys that you see represent frequency differences. So a peak means that may occurs frequently with verbs in this semantic area. And uh, you clearly see that some verbs, some individual verbs, stand out in this historical period. For instance, in the speech act area of the graph, we see a peak around the verb say, together with thank, guess, and ask. So speech acts during the first half of the 19th century, that was a conventional expression with may. A bit further down, uh, there is the verb see, and the large plateau that you see in the lower middle of the graph comprises action verbs such as make, work, and give, along with many others. In the middle, there is a peak around the verb seem, um, and above that, there's another peak with verbs like prove and explain. Now, I'm again oversimplifying, but some of these peaks show may in its permissive meanings, for instance, with um, say, yeah, if I may say so, and others are associated with may in its epistemic meanings, like seem or explain. Yeah, this may explain why he didn't show up. Uh, in other words, there are permissive and epistemic territories on this map that we can distinguish. Now, with the historical frequency information we can gather from the koha, we can actually track changes in the peaks and valleys of the semantic landscape. Um, so as we move into the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the permissive areas on the right of the graph thin out. Yeah? If you focus on the verbs say and see on the right-hand side, these semantic areas are becoming less populated. Yeah? Fewer usage tokens in that semantic area. And this trend further continues into the second half of the 20th century. So we see a strengthening of the clusters that includes verbs with which may conveys epistemic meanings, chiefly towards the left-hand side of the graph. We could look into these developments further, but my main aim here was to show you the principle of how you can map out a semantic space and then use historical frequency information to visualize quantitative change within that semantic space. Okay, I'd now like to come to the fourth and final part of my talk, which will again focus on a wider set of grammatical constructions. Specifically, I want to discuss how pairs of near synonymous modal auxiliaries can be distinguished on the basis of their second order collocates. If you've never heard this term before, don't worry, I'll explain what this is about. So, the two pairs of constructions that I'll focus on are may and might on the one hand and must and have to on the other. And this is recent work that I've been doing together with Susanne Flach. In this study, Susanne and I wanted to find out whether the immediate linguistic context of may and might would allow us to distinguish systematically between near synonymous models and between different meanings of the same model. In other words, how do speakers make a choice between may and might when both are available and both would convey approximately the same meaning? And then second, how do hearers disambiguate different senses of may when they are confronted with a specific utterance? Let me make this more concrete with an example. So we turn to the British National Corpus to retrieve concordances like the one that you see here. And we manually annotated these concordances for a simple two-way distinction between epistemic meaning, where may encodes a possibility, and deontic meaning, in which may encodes permission. 
And uh, in this concordance, the first line is clearly epistemic. Yeah, It may be inappropriate at this moment. And as hearers, we understand that without any problems. The question now is, can we get a computer to understand it as well? Does a limited context of just a few words to the left and right hold enough information so that we can reliably distinguish between the two? Now, context vectors of five or even ten elements do not hold a large amount of information, but the information that is present in each concordance line can be substantially enriched if we consider the so-called second-order collocates of May in these concordance lines. So in order to tap into that information, Suzanne and I built a large semantic vector space of 20,000 vocabulary items and 20,000 collocates. So each vocabulary item is represented by a context vector of 20,000 different collocates. We use the semantic vector space together with our concordance lines. And now suppose that we have one concordance line and we want to create a semantic representation of that concordance line. What we do is that we look up the context items of May in that concordance line in the large semantic vector space that we created. So for concordance line number one, we look up the context items approach, mean, inappropriate, and moment, and we add up their collocate vectors, which gives us a single long vector comprised of 20,000 values. And this now is our rich representation of concordance line number one. <clears throat> now, of course, we do the same for all the other concordance lines as well until we have, for each of our concordance lines, a long context vector of 20,000 second-order collocates. Proceeding in this way, we created a database with concordance lines for may, might, must, and have to, with each of them being represented by at least 1,100 concordance lines. On the right-hand side of the table, you see that most lines only had four or five context items that we looked up in the large semantic vector space. So essentially, what we're asking here is, are four or five words of context enough to disambiguate two senses of may if you have rich information about the collocates of these context items? The answer is, of course, that, well, it doesn't give you 100% accuracy, but second-order collocates do tell you something. Let me show you some results on the discrimination between must and have to. So when we take equally large concordances of must and have to, and we try to disambiguate them on the basis of second-order collocates, the classification accuracy outperforms the chance level by more than 12%. That's nice. But, of course, it's not the only thing that we can learn from the analysis. We also learn that certain types of lexes are actually highly predictive of the competing alternatives. For example, must is preferred in the contexts of computational terminology, as in the examples of this slide here. So in an example like the SSR must refer either to an SPR or to a valid module, we have a lot of technical computational lexes and we have an instruction to the reader of that computational manual and for that must is used. By contrast, contexts that are conversational and that contain everyday colloquial lexes, they make it more likely that the analysis chooses have to. So for example, up here we have they have to become referees, they have to become coaches, or all right, that's the way it has to be, gonna look, and so on and so forth. So with regard to speakers' choices between alternative models, we can say that second-order collocates allow us to model these choices with some accuracy. As for the hero side, the results for the disambiguation process are actually a bit better. Yeah? Second-order collocates allow us to discriminate between deontic and epistemic may with 66% accuracy and between deontic and epistemic must with 74% accuracy. Again, 
this quantitative perspective is usefully followed up with some qualitative analysis. So this graph here visualizes how second-order collocates allow us to discriminate between different meanings of may. The separation between epistemic may in red and deontic may in black is of course not perfect, but given that we only look at a few words to the left and right, it's actually encouraging that we see a distinction at all. Now, among the examples that are correctly identified as deontic and epistemic, we have, for example, epistemic example number nine. Uh, other areas where it may break down are areas of high biological activity. So we see several scientific terms that are indicative of epistemic meaning. And for deontic, we have number 14, um, elected honorary treasurer, and may I have a seconder for that proposal, please. So in that example, we have the highly informative collocate, please, which collocates with the meaning of permission. Right, so to learn more about the analysis and about how the model works, it's very instructive to look at examples that are actually misclassified. So on this slide, you see two misclassified examples. Epistemic example 18 is misclassified as deontic because it has words such as ladies and gentlemen in it. Yeah? Uh, so the example is here, across here, gentlemen, this may hurt a little bit. Uh, it's about a possibility, but ladies and gentlemen frequently occur in examples where someone asks for permission. Another misclassified example is deontic example number 19. Flows of traffic justify and coming, if I may, before Mr. answers to give them time to think. Now, if I may, yeah, that's a case in which a hero would have no trouble at all identifying the meaning as deontic because the set phrase, if I may, is associated with the meaning of permission. Now, for our analysis, this is somewhat unfortunate because both if and I are excluded as stop words and are not even present in the semantic vector space that we're using. So our method has simply no way of exploiting that information that is readily available to hearers. The moral here is that second-order collocates are clearly informative, but of course they do not give you the whole story, neither with regard to the competition between alternative forms nor with regard to word sense disambiguation. Let me come to a close here. Uh, the main point that I would like you to take away from this talk is the idea that we can think of constructions as networks between a grammatical element and the lexical items that typically co-occur with that grammatical element. These networks have links of varying strengths, and crucially, these strengths may change over time. Collocational shifts are something that we can measure, and they are something that allows us to analyze semantic change. In my talk today, I have discussed a few examples that all come from English and how English expresses modality, and I don't need to tell you that there are many other areas that would benefit from this kind of analysis. So looking at collocational shifts is something that can not only be used to analyze modal constructions, but quite generally all kinds of constructions that have open slots for lexical elements. Now, whether you turn to collostructional analysis, to motion charts that show changing collocational preferences, to semantic vector spaces that give you a bird's eye view of semantic landscapes, or if you explore second order collocates, the main underlying idea that I want to close with is really the same in all cases. If we want to get at the meaning of constructions, one way of doing that empirically is to conduct a corpus-based analysis of the lexical items that co-occur with those constructions. And with that, I'd like to end and thank you for your attention, and I look forward to discussing your questions with you.